three, four. My name is David Steen. I live in Radium Springs, New Mexico. My name is Jeff Gocher. I live in Radium Springs, New Mexico. I love the Southwest. I was raised in the Southwest. I love the desert. It's almost religious for me just to go out into the desert where it's quiet and get around, get away from people. It feels soothing. I met Jeff Gocher, who's my present partner, in 1990. I'm from Elder, uh, El Dorado, Texas. People call it El Dorado, actually. And I uh, was born in San Angelo, Texas, which is real near to El Dorado. In his hometown, El Dorado, we're just accepted as a couple. We were remodeling this uh, old Hot Springs Hotel. We bought the hotel 19, in October of 1995. We lived here from 1990 until 1995. We were just remodeling it at the time. We were working on the hotel. Everything was fine for five years. Uh, actually, it was virtually finished and ready to, ready to open. We came home from El Paso one night and there was a fence in the road, a gate right, right in the middle of the road. And we threw on the brakes and stopped. And, and we had to park, we parked the car there and walked home. Well, it wasn't pleasant thoughts of whatever I thought at the time. The night I met him, his dad had had a fight with him. I had to open a gate or something silly. I mean, you know, they would fight over silly stuff like David could never do anything the way his dad wanted it. Well, I met Jeff, I was, I had been to see my, my father that weekend, and uh, I went every weekend, and that particular night, I, he just uh, upset me terribly. And so I left on Saturday rather than on Sunday, like I generally do. My father was really good at pushing buttons. I don't remember really what he said. It was just something to push some button of mine. <laughs> he could do that. And I went home and, and uh, I had a friend who's a deputy sheriff and he said, you've got to come out and go to a bar. You never get out and we're going to go to this bar. So we did. And there was Jeff Gocher. And so I started talking to him. I said, well, can I buy you a beer? And uh, he said, sure. And so I reached in my pocket and I didn't have, but uh, I think I had 50 cents. And I says, well, can I borrow a couple of dollars? <laughs> and and uh, that's, that's how, that, how I met him. His dad just loved him, I think, and, and worried about him, you know, but uh, so he got real mad and came home early. He usually spent the whole weekend with his father and he came that Saturday night and that's the Saturday night that I met him. So it was, that was good. When I first saw him, I thought he was, he was uh, uh, a country, some country guy. He was dressed, he was dressed in boots and everything. So I thought he was this country guy and he always wears boots and, and blue jeans and generally a white shirt. And he, I think the other on the first time I met him, and I did too. We were dressed identically. <laughs> Little did I know he lived in L.A. at the time. <laughs> Wasn't in country at all. Jeff was on the way to San Antonio going to see his mother, and he just stopped and stopped in Austin on the way. This was 1990, and he was. Uh, I thought he's after I met him. I thought he's very interesting. He had a he had a teepee on the back of his pickup and some snake skins. <laughs> and uh, I, and I, then the next day he wanted to go out and, and pick up dead bats, and I thought that was real unusual. <laughs> he had some friend in New Mexico who made some potion out of bat parts or bat wings, I'm not sure what. And so we went out under, there are a lot of bats in Austin, so we went out under the bridge and picked up, you can just pick them up easily there. And we picked up bats. <laughs> I grew up with my parents on a ranch, oh, about 20 miles from El Dorado, Texas. I had no brothers and sisters, so it was very quiet. Had a lot of time to reflect. And my mother was like a rancher, too. She rode horses and roped calves and, and did everything my father did. I went to graduate school in Mexico. I studied economics at the University of the Americas. I was a C student. I uh, never did homework. I went to Roosevelt High School in San Antonio. I was the only one that graduated high school, you know. Well, except for reform school. But, uh... 
I was the third, so yeah, I just kind of was just pretty much, I guess, left alone. My mom had to rent. She didn't have credit history, you know, had to work real hard. And, and we all had to pitch in and cook and clean and do that kind of stuff. And she worked for the government. She was in procurement. She got a civil service job after my dad left. If I was reading a baby book my mom wrote when I was born the other day, and uh, she said that baby, I was trying to unplug the fridge or something, and she goes, he's always into something mechanical. When uh, my dad left, my mother went to stay with my grandmother, and uh, one of my brothers was all muddy and went running up, running up to my grandmother, and she pushed him away because he was dirty. And my mother said, you couldn't do that to your real grandchild. And my grandmother started crying and said, well, you're not really mine. So that's how she found out. My two older brothers were hoods, so they were cool, you know, smoking and with the duck tails and everything. And I was kind of like the one who actually liked going to school, <laughs> you, know, you know, so I was kind of like the nerd. I joined the army and uh, that was the best thing I could do at the time. You know. I got to go to Southeast Asia. <laughs> I came back and spent the rest of my time in El Paso, actually, in the laundry. I hitchhiked around, I went over to Canada and hitchhiked around. It's like everybody else had gone to Canada during the war and I waited till I got back, you know. But uh, did that and then I came back and my brother, my younger brother had gotten shot in uh, some misunderstanding that went bad or some misunderstanding of a dope deal that went bad or something and uh, he's paralyzed from the waist down and uh, gets spinal meningitis. So I got a job in the laundry at the hospital there and until they could move him for about six months. And then he brought him back to San Antonio. I stayed there in Durham, got a job in a little apartment. And then we brought him back to San Antonio and uh, he committed suicide. When I brought him back to San Antonio, I joined the Navy because we didn't have insurance and he could be my dependent. They made the mistake of stationing me in San Francisco. <laughs> I was definitely influenced by my, especially my grandfather on, on my mother's side. He was sort of special. He was very special. He always said, if you don't have something good to say about somebody, don't say anything. And I've always felt that way. And I don't, I don't like bickering and, and drama and arguments and division, all that kind of crap. I, that drives me crazy, and it, that's the one thing I really learned from him. And my parents were like that. They didn't talk about other people. They just sort of let people alone. And that's, they were sort of like had sort of a Mexican influence, because that, that was part of Mexico also where I was raised, very, very near to the border. And most everybody looked at life like that. My grandmother used to come to town, we'd go down on the river and throw tortillas to the perch. We'd eat out, you know, and that was a big deal. Hard woman. I think she was married like five times. She's like Annie Oakley. I mean, she's pretty rowdy, pretty tough woman. She didn't like to buy food, so we'd have to go hunting. And she would kill rabbits and quail and dove, and we would have to skin and clean them. She was worried because there wasn't a man in the house that she had to take care of that, you know. So I think she did the best she could with what she knew now, you know. The older you get, you get more forgiving. We had looked at a hotel in Del Rio, Texas, which we wanted to buy, which cost $20,000. And we were going to buy it, but we couldn't get clear title to it because it, it belonged to a family who had, had gone through generations with no will. So there were just maybe hundreds of offspring who could have claimed it. So we couldn't get clear title anyway to the hotel. And so we, were not, we weren't able to buy it. And then this friend of ours said, well, she knew this one. And, in Radium Springs, New Mexico. And so she called and said she'd found this place. She'd seen it uh, advertised in the Santa Fe newspaper. And so she called us and said, you gotta come see this place. And I had sold my house in Madrid and kind of still wanted to have something in, in New Mexico and David kind of liked Madrid. And so she called and said she'd found this place. We came out here to look at the place. And it was in really bad shape. We just saw this in this hotel, which was in really in need of, of repair. It was like a teardown. The windows were broken out. There were cattle living in part of the building. It, and uh, it had holes. There had been holes in the roof and, and it leaked down and all the ceilings had come down in the building because uh, the water had leaked through. And there weren't even any floors in, in parts of it. It was just a, uh, uh, just a tear down, actually. We saw a great old building that had been really neglected and abused. The whole place had been painted red. 
and had been remodeled hundreds of times poorly. There was Formica, there was shag carpeting, there was linoleum, there was no ceilings, the doors had been kicked in, the stairway had been cut off. There was a door upstairs, you opened it and you just fell to nothing, you know, from the second story. There was no plumbing. All the toilets had been used and shut because the pumps hadn't been working. Um, so there's no electricity, no pumps. You know, without electricity, you can't have water. And so the thing, it just was slowly deteriorating, deteriorating. Cows inside the building. And uh, so we packed up, moved in. First, we stayed in the bar, and there wasn't any outside doors until we got the electricity turned on and the well, the first well up and running at five, and got the new pump and started just restoring it. I didn't, you know, I looked at everything and said, I can do that, I can fix that, not realizing it's 9,000 square feet. You know, me, a project is uh, two months, I can redo a house or so. This took a little longer. It is annoying. I'm actually, because of my lungs, I can't dig or anything anymore. And that's very annoying for me because I've always done everything. Because when I try to dig, I get about, you know, one foot and I got to rest for 15 minutes. But I think that's part of getting older too. You figure out ways of doing things with less energy. We've been playing find the pipe. Okay, so. I've got a new pump out there, and I've got a one-inch line all the way up to the, the cottage, and it brings the cold water in for the big tubs in this tub. And I've got a break here, because it goes down to half-inch line, and I need to get uh, more water delivery, so I have to replace the whole line. Pretty much it. Oh, that's the train. So if you live here, you have to love trains. i through about three or four times a day. About twice a year, once twice a year, the Orient Express will come through though. And there'll be all these people on great dresses and, and tuxedos and having cocktails. And I'll be out there hoeing in the yard and looking up going, I used to do that. <laughs> I had bought a house for $15,000. It was a duplex in not too far from downtown Austin. And he helped me fix it up so it was livable because I lived in an apartment when he got there and he f helped me fix it up, fix it up. And then, there, in, in that time, the, the bottom had just dropped out of the real estate market. It was, they were just giving things away. And we bought some uh, houses on credit cards that were there. They were so cheap. And you could pay for They would pay for themselves in the rent in a year or two, two years at the most. So we bought them and fixed them up. And we did this for years until we, uh, until we moved to New Mexico. We moved to New Mexico in 1995. Then we had enough to live off of the rent money, so, and everything was nice, everything was rosy. <laughs> we wanted to fix it up, fix up the building, and it had hot springs, and, and, and I fixed up the bathhouse. And we had intended for our other partner to run it because her, uh, her family had had a restaurant and a hotel. And so she had uh, experience in that, and of course we have had none. We were going to do the construction on it, and she was going to run the, the hotel and the restaurant and bar. But after she stayed about three or four months, she said she wanted to go back to Santa Fe. And then after two or three months, she didn't like it here much, so. We had to bar her out. She didn't like it here. So she took off and went Santa Fe, and here we are. <laughs> They had put up a, a, a sign earlier saying, this road is uh, subject to closure uh, at night. There's a yellow sign, you can see it down there. It says, road subject to closure without notice. And I turned to David and I said, what the hell is that? For five years, it was the only way here. And then we drive by and there's this sign that says road subject to closure. They'd put up a guard shack in the middle of the road and had started charging people to enter. But uh, they didn't charge people coming to see us and they didn't charge us. I went up to state parks, 
because it was, I figure they did it and, I, and they said we didn't do it. So I go to the county and they say we didn't do it. But then the next week I see there's a guard shack in the middle of a county road. It's a little toll booth. We drive by there, there's nobody in it. The next time I drive by, there's somebody in it. They want to charge me three bucks or five bucks to come home. And I go, you can't charge me. This is a county road. So they say, oh, you guys can go into the hotel. We live there. I say, what about my friends that come to visit me? Are you going to charge them three bucks? So, and they, no, if they tell us they're going to the hotel, okay. So I start making phone calls. Uh, why is there a guard shack in the middle of a county road? Nobody could tell me. We come home one night from town and there's gates across the county road locked. I don't know where these gates came from. They disappeared. They're in concrete, they're big metal gates with locks. But we didn't know they were gonna put the fence up until we came home that night and it was there. It's the one we didn't run over the gate in the first place. I parked my car and we got out and walked home. We called the county. First they said, that's not our road. And I said, yes, it is your road. And why did you allow somebody to close a county road? And they say, we're not sure it's a county road. And I said, it is a county road. It's on the, you know, the maintenance records. You've maintained it for years. I have dug up the paperwork where the state gave you the county road after the bridge here burned. Why, why are you letting them close it? And I would get the runaround. They would say, well, they closed it over safety reasons. And they said, well, they're building you a new road. But they stopped short of the Arroyo and the railroad track. And we say, well, we got to open the hotel. How are we going to get people in and out? And how are we going to get in and out? Well, you have that road. And we have funding to finish that road. So we're waiting, and, and they just dragged it out. They never finished the road. We get an engineer to come look at it. And it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to build a road through that Aurora reasonably, you know, for any reasonable amount of money. About a money amount of money. Um, get emotional over this. We had a meeting with Rolf, Rolf Heckler, who's the uh, regional manager of State Parks, the regional director. Stan Ellis, who's the local director of Leesburg Dam State Park. They uh, met with Dave and I in the dining room. And during the course of that meeting, they basically told us that their objective that they uh, don't want us to use Leesburg Canal Road as access to the hotel under any circumstances. And they informed us at that time of their influence with the governor. They said exactly our boss is a major player and you better, if that we will not support access to the hotel through Leesburg State Park. They said we had your bill killed. We had the governor, you know, veto your bill. Right now, we're dealing with Steve Pierce's office. We just met with him last week, and a representative from his office actually said, I don't see the problem here. He's not an engineer, but you know, to his way, there's got to be a solution. If you're, if you're looking for a solution, there's a solution. But it, it would seem that they're not looking for a solution here. You know, to improve the, the, the canal crossing and the Aurora crossing so that we could improve the county road and the gates be taken down. My name is Steve Pierce. I'm the congressman from the 2nd District of New Mexico. I recently asked my staff to investigate the situation at Radium Springs. There was a complaint from a constituent about access into a piece of property. So uh, they're taking a look at it. They're talking to the federal agencies. In uh, the business of government, things just happen sometimes without explanation. We'll work our way through it. Our county commissioner, uh, Oscar Butler, has been very helpful. As, but as far as he can go at the county commissioner level. I am Oscar Vasquez Butler, County Commissioner for District 1. We're presently at Leesburg Park on Leesburg Road, which is a road into the park area. And right behind me is a park recreational area. But as you can see the gate, the gate actually obstructs people from going into the Radium Springs Hotel area. That's the area that has been of concern to me since I was elected in 2003 to try to get access to the hotel so that they can open up. The hotel is a historical hotel. It would mean a lot for the economic development in the area. The history of it has been a hotel, it has been a brothel, it has been a jail for women, and it continues to be a historical landmark for this county. 
Last year, there were some funds available. According to um, my sources, the current state park director, Dave Simons, was, has uh, met with the governor and was able to get the governor to veto the capital outlay monies that were going to become available to give access to the hotel. The director's concern was that if we lift the gates, then the recreational area here would be a haven for much mischief by the local youth. I think there's a legal issue here where the state, state parks, puts a gate over county roads and prohibits uh, access to and from the area, besides being the hotel. This has always been accessible to community residents, to Gordiana County residents. And I'd like to see the, uh, the legal basis for the state to, to prohibit travel on a county road. The current director of uh, the state park does live on the premises. It's one of the, uh, you might say, benefits that the state director has in terms of living on the premise. This road was put in to give access to the hotel. There was, this was one of the, uh, either the access or the ingress to the hotel. The other portion was around the other end as well as the bridge over the river. And since the bridge burned down a few years back, the access that the hotel has had has been roads, county roads that are currently uh, gated by the state park. Last year, Senator Mary Jane Garcia, in conjunction with uh, our representative Andy Nunez, got together and appropriated some capital outlays monies. Those were the monies, I, I, I don't know the amounts, but those were the monies that were vetoed by the governor. For years, Mary Jane said she couldn't help it because it was a county issue, and then we'd say, no, it looks like it's a county issue. It is a county road, but it's a state who's closing it, you know. I'm Senator Mary Jane Garcia. I'm the majority whip in the state Senate, and I represent District 36 in Doniana County, New Mexico. In uh, the year 2005, I sponsored uh, legislation, a capital outlay bill uh, for the amount of $318,000. The bill had tremendous support because a lot of my colleagues had already met the two gentlemen there, David and Jeff, and they were very um, uh, supportive as I was, but the monies were vetoed and I couldn't understand why. I felt that they were being um, hurt and uh, I later heard that the Park Service, uh, or State Parks, whoever, had asked that the money be vetoed because they didn't want any um, impact of traffic through the park. My reaction to the uh, lobbying effort on part of the parks, um, I was hurt because the governor was too new and I thought perhaps he didn't understand the issue. And I really wanted to help David and Jeff because I knew that they had a gem for economic development. And it was hurting not only them, but the state. I mean, we could get some money from that facility, gross receipts tax, you know, lodgers tax, all of that. And that wasn't happening. And I kind of resented it when I heard why the monies had been vetoed. And as a result of that, you have to go through a very long distance to reach the facility. And if you don't know how to reach it, you can get very lost. We need to do something. We can't just let this place be isolated. That's what it is. Or if you're going to reach it, you're going to have to go a long ways and then through an arroyo, hurt your car, damage your tires, etc. We need to come up with a solution. We can't just let, let these two guys who have invested an enormous amount of money to, to rebuild the place that was badly flooded. We had it pretty well ready to open until the flood came. And it did a lot of damage and it took us uh, oh, several months, probably four or five months to get it back to where it was. That was in June 17th, year 2000. They had a cloudburst up in the mountains between our house and the freeway. Uh, up uh, northeast of here, and all that all that water comes through here and goes under, uh, goes through our road, which is now our road. And of course, at that time, it was probably 12 feet deep under the railroad trestle, so we probably had 10 feet or 12 feet of water and that, at that and during that time. And it, it tore down. It was so high, we have about a 14-foot berm in front of our house, and it and it tore that down, went through it, and and all the water came right into, right into the hotel, the house. 
So that set us back, but then about, it was only, a, uh, that's when they closed the road, just a, a, a matter of weeks, a couple of weeks after, after, right after the flood. And we were devastated by the flood, and then they immediately closed the road. And at that time, we were real concerned about the flood and fixing everything up and trying to get everything back to normal. We didn't have a lot of time to spend talking to the state or EBID or county or anybody. And we, <clears throat> we were mentally in shock for about, a, about two weeks uh, that that ever happened. So it took us a while before we ever figured out, you know, who ever even closed it. The state parks uh, built the barricade. My name is Rebecca Anamati. I'm a resident of Fair Acres, New Mexico. My role with the hotel has been as, I guess, community activist. Um, I've worked in this county for many years as a victim advocate. I almost see the hotel as a victim of red tape and um, bureaucratic nonsense. And so I have lent them my knowledge of how to work with government agencies and, um, you know, have just tried to be supportive of them. I'm not the only one. There is a band of warriors of people who want to see this hotel open. It has taken thousands of hours and hundreds of, of contacts and meetings and so on and so forth to find out that we just weren't told the whole truth. This is a letter from Governor Bill Richardson back in January 2005 saying that all our information has been forwarded to the New Mexico, New Mexico Department of Transportation. And I will get a more detailed response from that agency. And then David has a letter from Bill Richardson. It says, uh, my information has been forwarded to, uh, to the New Mexico Energy, Minerals, and Natural Resources Department. This department oversees the New Mexico State Parks. And here I have another one from the New Mexico State Parks. David Simon, Director of New Mexico State Parks. It says, Governor Richardson has received your letter and PowerPoint presentation about the Radium Springs uh, uh, Hotel and ask me to respond. I feel that we've just been shuffled around from one department to another and eventually hoping that we'll go away or, or that we'll forget about it. They want to force us to use this, the Arroyo, which, comes, which is impassable when, when it rains. And the county says they can't maintain it, we're supposed to financially maintain it. And the only other way we can, we can come is, through, is going through the state parks, which was the road when we bought it in the first place. I think one of the things that really bothers me is the fact that I feel as a citizen when I go to a government agency and I ask a question that I should be told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I think the thing that really bothers me about this is that, you know, when I heard about how, you know, everyone was blaming each other for putting up the gate. I personally went and started asking questions and I was told the same thing and then over the years that we've been working on the political side of this, uh, it's become apparent that I was not told the truth. Well, my name is Meredith Carroll. I live at the corner of Tell High and Desert Edge in Radium Springs, New Mexico. Well, from what I understand, they shut the road down and it's been a hassle because it's what I know of it is it's supposed to be a public access road. Dave and Jeff, they've been really working hard, doing everything they can. Every time they get something right, they'll go submit. The next thing, oh, well, you gotta fix this. And the last thing I remember them saying is, they told me, is they're saying, well, we'll go ahead and give you a permit, but you gotta have uh, a backhoe or a front end loader to clean the road in case it rains so people can have access out there in case of emergency. And it's like, well, right now, I know a, a fire truck couldn't get to that hotel the way it is right now, because they can't get under that uh, underpass, that railroad trussle. And to me, it's like, well, you gotta get things fixed where people are at. And that road was already in effect, it's already been there. They put a bar across, said no access. Then they went and I think they tried to condemn the bridge that it has some faulty support systems or something like that, and it's like, I don't know, sounds sort of, what's the word, fishy? <laughs> In the meantime, we've been th through three road managers. We've been through a couple of engineers. We've been through one flood control guy, um, county managers, a couple of three of them. 
And every time we get a relationship going with one of them, they change it, you know, and then you got to start all over. Uh, I've been dealing with state parks and uh, Dave Simon up in Santa Fe, who's director of state parks. When we bought the place, the previous owners uh, made us sign uh, an affidavit saying that we had talked to the transportation department because there was some rumor that that might close uh, the road, which is Doniana Road, which can, comes to our doorstep through Leesburg uh, Park. We had, had consulted with the transportation department, and the transportation department said we have no, uh, we have no, uh, we have no plans to close that road, and if we ever do, we'll build a better road. Uh, his name was George Avalos. He was head of the transportation department. I don't know, for Doniana County. He said they would not close that road. If they did, they'd build a, a better paved road. This was in 1995 we met Mr. Avalos. He just said we're not gonna, we won't close the road or else we would never bought the place. The director of state parks currently and who we've been dealing with is Dave Simon. He was appointed by the governor, uh, Governor Richardson. And uh, Stan Ellis, who is the, uh, the, uh, the head of Leesburg State Parks, he lives on the state park himself close to the road, right above the road, right above the bridge that they closed. I'm sure, you know, that he would prefer not to have any traffic going by there at night or, or hotel, you know, me even passing by his house at night. He has a nice, quiet, little kind of isolated, beautiful sound, you know, surrounding on the, on the canal. Ultimately, the person that could fix this tomorrow would be Governor Richardson. He seems to almost distance himself when we, our correspondence just gets forwarded to his state park director. We get a nice response from the governor's office and then it gets forwarded over to Dave Simon, who responds to me, and then it's like, you're an and, and my response is, you're inaccurate. These are not truths. You know, this is not accurate. Um, so we're just going around, and in the meantime, there's more and more time passing. To me, it's obvious that, that, that there's a law protecting a county road. I've looked at other cases, and in, in when I'm looking at the county commissioner's records, where they've had numerous people remove fences when they've fenced off county roads. But just in this one instance, because it's a state agency doing it, nobody seems to know what to do. I'm asking the government to step up and do the right thing. This is a situation entirely created by government at some level between the county, the state, or the feds. Somebody has failed, and this shouldn't happen, that if you're gonna close a road, involve the community and come up with a, you don't leave somebody hanging high and dry. You know, if you're gonna close a road, there are laws that are supposed to protect me. We have an obligation to follow the law, and so do they. You know, we, don't, we can't, they require a lot of us to open a hotel as far as, you know, uh, fire safety and things. So we follow the law and, you know, environmentals or whatever. We try to follow the law. It seems arbitrary in that they make up their own rules or ignore rules as they go along. And I don't think that's fair. And I know that's not fair. I feel that it was closed illegally. I have never seen any... Uh, documentation that gave anyone the authority to close this gate. Um, I think as a citizen if I ask a question I should be given the answer. Um, after all I'm a taxpayer in this county. I think that if I ask why is this gate here and who gave the authority to do this I think I should have the correct answer to that question. There were no public um, uh, meetings or notification, no letters, no nothing. For several years, no one knew who did it or what the reasoning was. I think it is really, really sad with New Mexico having so many problems with unemployment and, um, and desperately needing jobs for citizens that any business would take 11 years to get a business license. It is just outrageous that anybody would have to go that long to get a business license. We finally got it in December, and um, it was almost a letdown to finally get it. Um, the problems with opening this hotel has had a devastating effect on the health of the owners. <coughs> it's been difficult for me to watch, and it's not my hotel. Because the primary access to the hotel has been closed by the gate, it now causes a problem for emergency responders uh, trying to access the hotel. I can't breathe. 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 I can
volunteer fire department responded. They did a wonderful job. They know exactly how to get here and so on and so forth um, on the back road, which goes underneath the train trestle. Uh, is your name David? Yeah. Okay, we've got the ambulance on the way over there, okay? Okay, can I, is, is there nobody else there with you? Yes, you Okay, can I talk to them? I can't find him. You can't find him? No. Okay. Radio Springs Fire, Radio Springs Fire, 2200 County Road number D61, 2200 County Road number D61. It's going to be in reference to a male subject with COPD having trouble breathing. Okay, we've got him on the way over there, okay? Try, try not to talk so that way you won't use your, your breath, okay? Okay. Okay, just try and relax. Do you take medication? I'm going to have shock at you. Yeah, 
Instead of going to the nursery, you're going to um, turn to the left, under the bridge. That's okay. When that desert edge comes to a T, are we taking a left or a right? Stay right there to get to a rescue. Because the Doniana County Road going through Leesburg State Park is closed, some of the emergency responders do not know that there's a locked gate on that particular road. And because the access, the gated access to the hotel is on the maps, the fire chief had to leave and drive back out to meet the ambulance and lead them in to pick him up. Therefore, on February 21st, when this very serious um, 911 call was made for trouble breathing, the ambulance was not able to get through that gate, and it caused a delay in the medical services being provided to Jeff Gocher. It was a very, very serious situation because he was then on life support for two days, and we weren't really sure if he would make um, a recovery. Um, and he was then in ICU for another six days after that. Do you think the issue of homophobia is related to it not being open? <coughs> yes, I do. Hola. Mejor. Better than nothing. <laughs> Pretty good. Oh, you brought me lunch. That's okay. How you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. If you need any medicine from Mexico, I have like a whole pharmacy. <laughs> they kept switching me and switching me. So I was, I was telling um, David, I heard you back to the hospital and I want to come over and see you. It, it took me two days to even figure out what was going on. They can't find me. The damn ambulance couldn't find me again. It's like 145 Leesburg Dam Road. They can't get through. <laughs> you know? It's like crap. Go under the bridge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go <laughs> under the bridge. They did, but they made a right. They got to the end and they made a right. It's been very trying. I just thought you could call people and they would tell you the truth and you didn't have to document everything, you know. The road belongs to the people of New Mexico. The house that the state park director lives in belongs to the people of New Mexico. The park belongs to the people of New Mexico. You know, I don't understand why the people of New Mexico can't use their road. <laughs> we felt anger over the situation over the years, obviously, and and that that doesn't help to get along with people you're near. You tend to take it out on other people a little bit sometimes, and it's you know you don't want to, but you do, and it makes things rough. I'm real optimistic. I always have been. <laughs> I just think, you know, that, that it, it, what, what is done, for example, closure of the road, is, is totally illegal and it's not right. It's not, what, you can't do that in America. Anywhere else in America you couldn't do it and I'm not sure you can't here either. And so I just think that, that it, with time and persistence, they'll do what's right. And it, maybe it's political pressure. The people around here, virtually everybody in the county supports us and, and their votes and, and the people in, uh, in Albuquerque or Santa Fe or rather are going to hear about it and I think, you know, eventually if there's enough political support they'll, they'll do what's right. The, the head of the State Parks Commission uh, is Dave Simon. He said, uh, they said Dave Simon is a player, and he knows, you know, obviously the governor, and, and we got your bill killed. And uh, no telling what they told Governor Richards. I don't, you know, I, I don't think he knew the situation down here at all. I'm, I'm virtually certain he didn't know the situation here. And, uh, and once we get, once we can put that across to the governor, I'm sure that he'll look at it differently. But he probably heard one side of it, you know, like the homeland security or the, or vandalism or drinking or something like that, and thought, well, how logical to, you know, close a road, a client county road, uh, blowing up the dam, <laughs> or, you know, there's so many reasons we shouldn't have that road open. This should be a government for the people and of the people, and we have rules to protect the people, and. They don't always work, but they usually do in the end. If you live in a democracy, that comes with an obligation. 
And if you, you allow little rights to be chiseled away, whatever it is, little things, little things, my road, I mean, that's silly because it's affected me personally. You allow people's rights to be chiseled away, then you turn around, it's not a democracy anymore. We, you know, our four, forefathers and the people in Congress and today have a responsibility to know what they're doing, you know. I mean, there's a reason that we have the system that we have and that it's worked so well. You know, it's not perfect and it, we go through changes, but uh, yeah, you have an obligation. You have an obligation to vote. You have an obligation to get involved in your community. And if you see somebody who's not as fortunate as you are doing worse or in trouble, you try to stick up for what's right. We built clinics in Mexico. We take clothing to Mexico. We we let people come to the hotel if they're nonprofit. Or on Sundays, if they have arthritis, they soak. You know, we we we're very fortunate. You know, and we try to share that. And just if if you have something, you should be grateful for having it and share it because it just makes that more valuable. We both try to do that our whole lives. We have so much in common, it's amazing, I agree. We both feel good just being in each other's company. Tell me everything you're thinking, let me know just how you feel. I got to know if what you're leading up to here is real. I've been hurt too many times to want to go back there again. But I'm way beyond the point of seeing you as just a friend. There's one man who could make one, one phone call tomorrow and that road would be open. I really firmly believe that everything will come out in the end. This place was here before I was born. It's going to be here after I'm dead. The waters were here for centuries. I just say, and I say this often, but therefore the grace of God go I. You know, I could, if I'd had that guy's genes, if I'd had his parents, if I'd had his family, if I'd had all the experiences he'd had in life, I'd probably be acting exactly like that. Any anybody who gives whoever gives gives us trouble, like you know, in the, uh, in the state parks or somebody like uh, other people, you know, who've given us a little problem, some problems here. If I'd had their experiences, if I'd had their their uh, their upbringing, had their had their parents, had their genes, had everything that ever happened to them, I'd be them, and I'd be doing probably the same thing. You know? I wouldn't have any choice, and I'm lucky in that I don't. I'm not in the situation they are. I didn't think about we'd be talking about something like that, but I almost get emotional talking about things like that. Sit down, give me your hand.